It's a great honor to be back uh, with you all. Thank you for inviting me uh, to do this with you. Um, not only is it a great honor to be back with you, but I've always wanted to teach a course on Yates. And I've never had the occasion for some reason. I've taught Yates in all kinds of circumstances, but never focused specifically upon him. So it's, it really is, uh, as I say, a real honor to be with you all again, and really special for me to, to, to work on Yates with you. Um, I actually was in Boston this morning, uh, so I've <laughs> my, my hair is still wet uh, from flying here. Um, I went and saw somebody who you may know, uh, Nathan Glazer, um, who is 94 years old, and I spent the day yesterday filming him and then meeting with MIT Press for my new book, and uh, had to take a extra, I took a different flight from the one that was planned in order to, to make it on time, uh, and despite the bumps. <laughs> uh, we did it, uh, so that's good. Um, uh, I, I want to take on Yeats uh, as, a, as a modern and anti-modern poet uh, with you. Uh, Yeats is a very special person to me uh, for many reasons. The most significant one is that I had an economics uh, fellowship to Brandeis University and went with my father to the university when I decided to accept their offer and did a tour and went to the English department. Um, and at the English department, there were, at that time, and this was in the 80s, um, uh, many, many smoking pipes. Uh, uh, and the, the smoke was billowing out of this building and I, it attracted me, I think, more than anything. So I, I went into this smoky building and it was the English department. Uh, and I w asked if anybody was there who would speak with me, and there was one person who was present in the, in the building, and I was directed to his office with my dad, and we walked down the hallway, and we came to the end of the hallway into what looked like a kind of s sacred um, uh, tower of sorts, and I think tower will be the word that I'll use for a specific reason. And I walked in with my dad through billowing pipe smoke and stepping on what turned out to be matches that were all over the ground, uh, wooden matches, long wooden matches that were all over the ground. And we walked by ancient editions of poetry and turned towards the, the, the main part of the office where um, a man was sitting hunched over a Milton, an, an old Milton copy uh, with tiny little glasses and a silver pipe and a uh, three-piece suit that was disheveled. Um, and he had his head down and he looked up and he said, oh, God, come in, come in, tell me your name, in that exact voice. I actually, I, I perfected this over the years. <laughs> tell me your name. And I, and I sit down, please, sit down. Um, you're thinking of coming here. There's, there's one problem with, with uh, this place. It's probably too many Jews. Uh, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, you know, uh, in as much as you wish to study literature, this is a very special place. Anyhow, um, and as the conversation unfolded, I felt like he uh, began to speak truths of unimaginable importance. Um, one of them being, he looked at my father and he said, it is very uh, uh, dignified that you've brought your son here. Most alliances are not made between father and son, but between the son and the grandfather, um, because the alliances must skip a generation, the generation with which you struggle. Uh, uh, my father was a, a chemist so that I could be a poet. You know, so <laughs> you just feel like whatever it is that he's saying is worth knowing. Um, <laughs> and this is a true story. I actually never went to the economics department at Brandeis University, never once. I actually still to this day don't know what building it, it is in, even though I became a tour guide. Um, <laughs> instead, I took every single course uh, with this man uh, named Alan Grossman, one of the great, great American poets. Um, he won, I, many, I didn't know anything about him at the time, but he landed up, he won the Genius Award. Uh, he ended his career at Johns Hopkins. And he was, he became my hero. I, I emulated everything he did, which was strange because he was about seven or 800 years old when I met him. <laughs> and he had all of these characteristics of a very old, old man um, that, uh, whether they were cultured or cultivated, I'm not sure. And I worked with him very, very intently on Yeats uh, in particular. I, I say romantic poetry with him, but I, I worked very intently with him on Yeats. Uh, 
And his perspective on Yeats is something that I'm going to share with you because it's remained with me as a kind of central guiding principle. Um, Yeats remains also in my pantheon of heroes uh, an odd choice uh, in some ways. If my uh, other heroes are uh, early Nathan Glazer and uh, contemporary Noam Chomsky and Lord Byron and Marquis de Sade, uh, 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 William Butler Yeats is a problematic choice um, for his political allegiances and other things about him that we will talk about. But I, I think of him as, uh, if not the greatest, one of the greatest poets in the language. And, and I, I really think that it's, it is worth us contemplating and, and spending time uh, with him. Um, I also think of him in a distinctly anti-modernist perspective. And, and I, I want to today emphasize what that means. Uh, because I think it's very, very important that Yeats was doing something in a world that was falling apart. Uh, and he did something with poetry. Uh, and, and that's, that's what I'm going to focus on today. So I want to focus upon the, the, a, a world that was falling apart. Uh, maybe it's very appropriate <laughs> in this election uh, that, we, um, that, that, we, that we address the chaotic world uh, in which we live and ask if some of the fundamental poetic values that uh, Yeats upheld as bastions against the destruction and the chaos of the world bear some, refle uh, bear some rem uh, remembering today uh, for all of us. So, William Butler Yeats, have you, is everybody, who, is, who has read and studied Yeats? Or I guess read or studied, read, okay, have you all read, okay. And have you read his corpus or some of his works? Has, has anybody read all of it? Um, the biography of Elman? Okay, all right. Um, all of it? Oh, at Vanderbilt, wow. Damn, okay, well that's, that's competition right there. Um, Yeats, uh, for those of you who have not read the biography, was born in 1865. And there are geniuses when it comes to birthdays and names. Uh, you choose your name carefully. My name is Bars Ski. I became a professional skier and I worked in a bar at night to pay my way. <laughs> so you, you know, sometimes you have to be very careful. My doctor when I was young was Gutman. Uh, so you, you know, you, you have to, and you have to choose your birthday well. Uh, my birthday happens to be apparently uh, the best vintage year for Bordeaux, uh, 1961. Um, William Butler Yeats dies in 1939, uh, which is fascinating, I think, in light of what it was that he was struggling against in the world. But he's born in a very auspicious time, a, on a very auspicious date. And I think that he is, in a sense, he, his birth, and his youth mark the beginning of the modern period. The modern period can be delineated in many different ways, I think. And in fact, the argument has been made that modernism, in fact, begins somewhere around the Renaissance, uh, when in the 14th or 15th century, uh, people begin to leave uh, countryside and go and work in uh, agglomerations in city-states. Uh, they begin to work in cottage industries. They begin the process of alienation from their family, which continues all the way through the modern period. Um, an, an argument that's made in a book called All That Is Solid Melts Into Air, which is very, very, uh, if you feel like reading a, a book about modernism, it's a bit of a masterpiece. So that's an argument that I think we can take very seriously. Uh, and, but for our purposes, particularly for literary history, I think it's appropriate that we draw other lines, uh, we, because otherwise we would kind of end at the Renaissance and kind of say that we're still in the modern world, uh, which I think that we are. The argument is that we're in the postmodern world, which I'm uncomfortable with. Um, but we're, many of the things that we we'll talk about as being characteristically part of modernism uh, ex exist uh, today still, um, uh, with, with some variations that we'll talk about. So what are the moments that define, therefore, for the, pers for, for the purposes of this course, the beginning of modernism? Uh, one of them is uh, perhaps the one that's brought out most frequently is the death of God. Uh, Nietzsche's pronunciation that uh, we can no longer, uh, that it's no longer possible to believe uh, in a God. It's no, pos no longer possible to believe that there is a God uh, and that the world is somehow making sense relative to a supernatural power. Uh, and this occurs, as you know, uh, late 19th century, uh, in so somewhere around the period of Yeats's birth. So we might say there's, there's one moment, and it's the struggle to try and figure out meaning in a, in a godless world uh, that defines one characteristic of the modern age. But there are others 
that you could look at. And I think one of them th th that I think will be significant, at least for today, is uh, 1870, 1871. Um, the, the, for those of you who've taken the Zola course, you know that this is the, the Le Debacle, as uh, Zola described it, the terrible, uh, uh, preposterous war uh, with Prussia, which led to the founding of Germany. Um, but also the, de the, the decline and, and eventual dis dis uh, disparition of the uh, Second Empire, of Napoleon III, um, and the, the rise of the Commune uh, in, in Paris. So when Paris became governed by neighborhoods, people in neighborhoods, a kind of a communist dream uh, was fulfilled for a while in which all decisions are made by the people who live in a particular neighborhood. So. There too, I think it's a, it's, it's a significant moment, a significant time. The end of the 1870 also marks uh, the end, perhaps, arguably, of realism and naturalism. And here we're getting closer to the literary perspective. Uh, realism had dominated the 19th century since, uh, if, if you wish, since the death of the Romantic poets. As you know, if you're a Romantic poet, you die young, whether you like it or not. Uh, it's the, it's the purpose and the goal. Um, most of them were dead uh, by the second uh, decade of the 19th century. Those who weren't, uh, Wordsworth being the notable example, uh, died twice. He died uh, somewhere around the time when Byron died, and then he died again, his actual uh, death, because his, he stopped writing and then he went to the task of revision. And he revised works that he had done during his, as, as it were, romantic period. So if we were to think of English Romanticism as being characterized by the presence of, of uh, uh, Wordsworth and Keats and Shelley and Byron and, and Mary Shelley, and that all of them, uh, their, their passing marks the end of the Romantic period, then the next period that is significant for us in terms of what we're talking about is the rise of realism and in particular the realist novel. So all of these novels that we know and love, and regrettably our students know and love them less than they used to. Uh, it used to be the touchstone that you would use as a literature professor. You could always pull out your Dickens and ev that didn't sound right. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, and everybody would know what you were talking about. Um, but now it's no longer, it, it, it is no longer uh, currency that we can draw upon, which is uh, sad, I think. In, in the French side, um, you, would, you would talk about Balzac and uh, Flaubert, and then in the later part of the century, you would talk about Zola, and Zola was different, as you know, from having uh, taken courses here, um, in the sense that he had a scientific basis for his approach to literature, that it wasn't just the depiction of the real world with uh, very, very uh, clear and precise descriptions, but it was also based on a scientific principle about the relationship be between biology and uh, the, the world that surrounds us. So in, in arguably, and we could say a lot about the 19th century, but arguably one of the central tendencies of the, of the modern, of the uh, realist world is this sense that you can describe reality with prose in a way that will more or less capture the entire uh, setting that you're describing. So if we were to offer a realist description, we would describe the number of people here, what they're wearing and where they're from, and descriptions of their hair and their eyes and their backgrounds and so forth. And it would be uh, a lot of work uh, to describe a, a room uh, full of people. But this was the work that the realist novelists did. And since they were paid more or less by the page, it wasn't bad. It was a good gig. And people like Dickens made a heck of a lot of money doing it. Um, as the century moves on, there is increasing sense that this is an, uh, it, it, we're missing something. Yes, we have a really strong sense of the, the realism and the real world, but the real world is perceived by individuals. And as we, we, we enter into a period dominated uh, by ideas of what the specific mind experiences, um, which, in, in my sense, harkens in some ways back to the Romantic period, uh, because they were watching their minds watch the world. But now it's, it, it's with a different emphasis, um, in, in particular in the work of Freud, uh, 
who's asking himself about th that which characterizes the subconscious and the uh, unconscious and the conscious minds that we all possess and that are all vaguely identical, but also each different one uh, depending upon the experience uh, relative to the other. So it's about perception. How do you perceive the world becomes a dominant theme and becomes a dominant modernism theme. So it's not if I describe every single thing in this room then I'm going to adequately capture what it's like. It's how does it feel to be in this room for me versus for you and you and what, what do our minds experience? What is the phenomenological perspective that we bring to this experience of, of, of the world? So now if this is the case then these quite clear realistic descriptions in literature are going to be deemed increasingly inadequate. So you uh, and and mo the modern world begins to question many of the precepts upon which we had based our, our assumptions about the relationship between, say, language and reality. In a realist perspective, language adequately re is capable of adequately representing reality. So the, the realist novel is really very highly descriptive and there's a, you know, if you ever study uh, realist novels in a language that's not your own, it's a great way to learn the language because there are words that you've never heard of uh, constantly uh, because there's so much description, there's so much emphasis upon knowing everything. You gotta know everything. Well, in the modern period, you begin to think that knowing everything isn't enough um, because the subconscious, the dream world, the, the artifices of the mind, the, the passions and so forth, in fact, color and affect the way that we perceive the world and that we need to somehow adequately represent them. So that's a tension and a tendency that begins to arise more frequently um, in, in, the, in, in the latter part of the century for reasons that we'll talk about. This, the second thing that uh, happens is, and for our, the purposes of today's course is very important, is the, to this point, we had primarily relied upon a series of poetic conventions in the genre of poetry. So if you had in the realist novel a very strong effort to represent reality with realist prose, in the poetic world you had a poetic tradition that went back at least as far as Milton and uh, you know for, for a language that sounds contemporary. And, and then to a series of techniques that are used to adequately exhibit the thought that, or the idea or the, 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 the muse's sense that you're trying to represent. So all of these things that you studied as uh, high school students um, were already present, as you know, uh, in the uh, in Middle Ages, late Middle Ages. In fact, you could find it in Greek literature and so forth. The, pros you know, the prosody, the po all of the characteristics of poetics and rhyme and rhythm and feet and all of these other things that were centrally important to the reading of poetry. And you, these conventions were relied upon as shorthands, in a sense, for saying something much larger. If you invoked a symbol from the ancient world, then just by its invocation, you've managed to say a lot. Because that symbol connects you backwards in time, as far back as human civilization, certainly Western civilization thinks. So that when you invoke the spider, or the tower, or the tree, or the rose, what comes with it is a plethora of, uh, of ideas and symbols and so forth and so on that are of monumental importance to all, to, we're, we're talking about the Western world, I think it's, it's true for the entire world, but focusing on the Western world is less problematic. You have a different set of symbols in some ways. Um, so the, 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 the conventions were needed to be learned and the way that you learned poetry, as we know from Harold Bloom, uh, was that you would first assimilate the father and then you'd kill him. Uh, and that's why that insight of Alan Grossman was so significant. My, my job as my father's son was to learn everything that he knew and then kill him, right, and surpass him, overcome him. Um, and the, Bloom's famous book in this regard is called The Anxiety of Influence. So you. The, the, the anxiety is that you have to rise up to your father's level, or your, uh, the, the poetic father. It's uh, gendered in either direction you would like. And then once you've assimilated, to, to take a, another step forward, to go somewhere 
to go somewhere else. So the task of learning poetry was partly, and you know this from your own youth, to memorize poetry. You had to know it, and you had to know every comma, every line, every, every possible characteristic. And I'm sure that a lot of you had exams, as I did uh, in Boston, where you had to reproduce the poem perfectly first and then do an analysis of it. And if you missed a comma, it's like you had violated some principle, um, some basic truth uh, that, the, that the poem was able to convey. Because the, the poem was a kind of Grecian urn, a, a perfect representation of a world. And if you take a piece out of it, it doesn't, it doesn't hold together. It doesn't make as much sense. So that's the world of the, of the poetic world that you're ostensibly dealing with. So experimentation in poetry is limited because you draw from all of the conventions that exist in poetry in order to send the poetic message that you're trying to send. The modern world begins to challenge all of the conventions that had been traditionally employed to convey meaning in poetry. That's the really pr uh, primary sense. And I've, so uh, there are many examples of this, of, of this occurring, and I've simply named a few of them. Um, so I say the most striking element of modernist poetry is the invention and experimentation of new modes, new modes of expression. Modernism includes the many isms, and therefore many different ways to express ideas and feelings, including the imagist, the symbolist, the realist, the impressionistic, the expressionistic, and the surrealist. So each of these are, as it were, efforts at trying to properly convey the world um, but in very, very different ways, one, one from the other. So in the imagistic uh, example, and we'll take a look at that as regards the work of Ezra Pound, the imagistic way of presenting just, just concrete images for the readers to understand the idea and experience the feeling themselves. So you, rather than relying upon what, when they, when they were trying to insult poetry during this period, you would call it flowery. Right. So rather than relying upon the flowery uh, re representation or expression in, in poetry, you would use very concrete images. And it, as it, it would be, as it were, uh, uh, implicit that the reader him or herself had to fill in the edges. Uh, so imagism relies very heavily upon kind of sparseness, like the haiku, let's say, uh, is, 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 is another example from another world. Uh, of, of that same idea that, you, that the reader has a lot of work to do, as it were. Uh, the symbolist way of presenting things, and here the example that I will give uh, will come from Baudelaire. Um, the symbolist way of presenting things in terms of deeply significant symbols uh, of ideas and feelings for readers to interpret them intellectually. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see the way that works. Realism, of course, doesn't go away. Uh, realism continues to uh, exist. Realism still exists today. All of the best-selling novels in the airport that I just came into uh, are all re more or less realist novels. Uh, it's, it's hard to get away from that. The impressionistic way of presenting unrefined first impressions of everything of the observer. And you know this, of course, from impressionism in art, but you can also uh, try to represent this in literature. So it's that first, imp the impression, that first impression is very important. The expressionist way of probing deep into one's own psyche. Now, of course, as soon as you see the word psyche, you know that we're into a Freudian realm. You know that you're into the realm of discussing that subconscious or unconscious world that, that uh, is, is within us. And trying to express the hidden and deepest feelings as in confessional poems. But confessional poems that go to the kind of inner struggles that are characteristic of all of us, but are defined differently in each person, interestingly. And then the surrealist way. Uh, here, of imposing the mo mood of madness, <coughs> intoxication, and neurosis to excite the illogical language of the unconscious. Okay, so these are a few examples of the types of things that were done. I'm teaching a course right now called From Dada to the Beat Generation. And it's the basis of a, of a book that I'm, I'm working on. Um, and it's, it, it is in particular this effort that's represented, I think, in, in Dadaism and the, and the beats. Yeah. How does the impressionistic modernist differ from the romantic poet? Ah, 
there, there's a, a my, my opinion is that there's a very strong cyclical nature to the genres of literature. And you put your finger on one of the principal hypotheses of the course, which is that modernism reproduces many of the efforts of the uh, romantic world, but maybe with a different set of tools. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I think that if you looked carefully, for example, at Shelley, Shelley is basically taking his brain and carrying it around to really weird and exotic situations and seeing what happens to it, which is a nice description of a lot of experiments that were done in the modern world by including the beats. What does my brain look like? What, is my, what does the world look like now? Now if I add a few drugs, now what does the world look like? Now how about a little bit of wild sex? Oh, okay, now let's see what the wor world looks like. It's like you're taking your brain around in a jar and you know, you're either driving across America or you're uh, adding something to it. And Shelley does the same thing except he does it in the Alps. Mm -hmm. So he brings it up to cliffs, uh, he brings it up to the base of mountains and he says, well, so what's happening to me now? What, is this, what does this literary intoxication look like in this case? So there's a very strong similarity. The difference is, and there's also a similarity in the sense of the death of God. Um, some of the, most of the, most, many of the major uh, romantic figures, certainly the ones that we've talked about uh, in classes previously here, most notably Shelley, um, did not believe that there was uh, a God, the God, uh, married, of course, to Wollst uh, Wollstonecraft's daughter <laughs> and, uh, um, and Godwin's uh, daughter. So th there is that connection as well. What are the differences? Nonetheless, I think Christianity is still more present and present in the, in the Romantic world in a different way. Uh, that's s significant. The tools, the scientific tools that you have in the late 19th century are different from the scientific tools that you have in the late 18th century, which I think is a, a significant difference. And in a sense, we're going through another thing now where, as you know, Vanderbilt's famous for brain sciences. Um, and we're doing brain sciences very differently from the way it was done 100 years ago because we have new tools. So it might be also that we could explain this in terms of the tools. But there are very, very important similarities, it seems to me, um, th depending upon who you're looking at. Yeah. So these are, these are some of the, uh, the various efforts, some of the various examples that we can talk about. Um, and to get a little bit more uh, concrete, in the example of imagism, notice the date, 1913. So we're into the very center of Yeats's life, right? He's born in 65, so this he's 38 years old. Uh, this is really the, 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 the really his most uh, the period of, his, of some of his most fruitful work, um, <coughs> characterized by direct treatment of the thing, whether subjective or objective, to use absolutely no word that does not contribute to the presentation. As regarding rhythm, to compose in sequences of musical phrase, not in sequence of the metronome. Uh, complete freedom of subject matter. Complete freedom of subject matter. That's gigantic. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because one of the characteristics of the realist novel is complete freedom of subject matter. Now you can talk about people such as the poor, uh, the alcoholic, uh, the mad, and so forth in literature. So this is a big shift, and you certainly see that also again in, in modernism. Free verse, um, common speech language, and the exact word was always to be used as opposed to the almost exact word. So colloquialisms uh, can enter. Uh, so that's one version of experimentation. Another is the use of uh, uh, new themes, new issues that are entered in as new subjects of the world. Uh, if it was the case in the 19th century, in the realist period that we've talked about, that you were sure about some things. Uh, you were sure about the, your place in the world, let's say. Uh, it becomes increasingly problematic, as you know. If you were sure about the existence of God, well, this becomes increasingly problematic. So you, as it were, you lose your moorings, you lose your anchor, um, which is great, great fun, because now you know, the world becomes your oyster in terms of possible experimentation. But as we'll see, it also, that it also becomes problematic, as we'll see. Um, traditional poetry had to be limited to subjects of universal significance, general human appeal, and so on, even when the poems were romantically personal on their surface. So that's another interesting link to romanticism is, yeah, they were carrying their brain around the Alps. But when you read Mont Blanc uh, from Shelley, he's posing the same questions that Milton posed. It, it's, not, it's not as it were, new, he's trying to figure out his, uh, human relations to nature, for example. This is not 
a new subject. In the modern period, you're taking on new subject. Modernist poetry, we read poems about just, just about any topic. We find poems about nature, eating plums, myth, satire of an old Christian woman, single characters, poor people, meaning of art, erotic memories of a woman, spiritual crisis, guilt of abortion, feminist movement, neurotic dis uh, dis uh, despise of a father, allegory of a life journey, irony of death, and so on. Everything becomes possible. So uh, the, the subject matter uh, can therefore shift. Um, and significantly for our course, modernist poets also violate some basic principles. Um, the principles of the kind of, I, I would call it something like a toolbox. You go to work with your toolbox. If you're a plumber or a welder or a roofer, you've got a toolbox and virtually any roof can be fixed with the stuff in your truck, uh, which is something that I have tremendous admiration for. Well, a poet also goes to work uh, with a toolbox. Form, style, stanza, rhythm, uh, and uh, you know, a, an entire history um, that is recorded in, for example, if you're familiar, I don't know if you were assigned this, but I had to read it as part of my undergraduate education, the Princeton Book of Poetics. It's like, a, it's this thick, and it's like a, a phone book uh, full of things that you can use to create meaning. Um, and there you look up metaphor, for example, and that becomes one of your tools, and it has about, you know, the equivalent of about 200 pages about the metaphor. Examples of it, what it's for, what it does, what it means, why it's, you know, it's mind-boggling. It's, it's, it's like the OED of, 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 uh, of, of, of poetics. So that's your toolbox, you carry it around. Well now, all of a sudden, that you've, you're, you take that toolbox and throw it away. Well you do so at great peril, uh, of course. Because on the one hand, you can represent things that had not been representable, perhaps, uh, using the old tools. But on the other hand, you lose the power of those tools, uh, which is, is difficult. Can you make up for them? And so forth. This is the anxiety of the modern world. You, 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 you no longer believe in God. There is, God is dead. You no longer imagine that, God, that it's possible that there be a God in this world. Well, you need to replace the concept with something, right? in, even institutionally. So you'll notice, for example, that English departments and most, many of the modern universities that are famous, including this one, uh, started in exactly this period. I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm using Terry Eagleton's argument here. With the death of God, uh, literature takes on a new importance. It becomes, in a sense, a space for ethical discussion outside of biblical texts. So it is also not surprising that early literature professors were uh, affiliated with the church. Um, because it, this is the secular version of the same questions. Now you do it in literature rather than doing it um, uh, with spiritual texts that no, no longer are comprehensible in a world without God. So you also notice geographically and institutionally, including here, uh, also where I just came from, Harvard, or where I was educated, um, McGill, the, the, it, interestingly enough, despite the fact that all of you maybe had kids who studied English and when they came home you said, what are you going to do with that? Um, nonetheless, the English department always has the best building. I don't know if you've noticed that. Always. The oldest building, the nicest building, the, the, you know, the, the most ancient and always the most central. Always. Uh, the, the English department here is in the building that was the administration building. So it's uh, the very heart and center of... Uh, and th there was this desire, I, uh, who knows, was aware of what, but um, uh, the previous dean wanted to move the English department into this building. I don't know if you've noticed, but the political science department is up there. I've never heard an English department get upset about anything, uh, except maybe the death of a dog or something like that. But they don't, they're just, they're just not politically inclined. It's not their thing, usually, unless they're, you know, Terry Eagleton or R Raymond Williams. But the idea of moving the English department out of, out of, that, out of Benton Hall was surreal. Are you kidding? Mean, they, were, they were marching in the streets, throwing, burning clothing and having placards and and it was interesting it was and you know there are instrumental reasons why perhaps they didn't want to move but I thought historically it was very interesting that that's, that there was such a rebellion so political science went up there because you know political science I don't care it's not a science anyway so <laughs> um, so the, um, it, interesting so in other words everything is being called into question the world is in a sense uh, being renewed but there's also tremendous anxiety in this newness
the, the end of the world is coming, as you know, 1900. We've been through that recently with 2000. Um, it was a, several of my friends got divorced, including me on that particular date. Uh, you think, well, it's the end of a world, I'm not sure which one. Uh, <laughs> um, that, so it comes to a, a head, you're afraid uh, as, you, as you head towards that period. It's a lot of, there's a lot of hope uh, and the, for renewal and there's a lot of fear. Uh, sometimes they are connected, maybe all of the time they're connected. Um, so in this world, the, the conventions are challenged and now um, we're beginning to throw away those tools that we had used forever um, as a way of conveying a new world. This is a very interesting example. This is called Les Foules uh, de Charles Baudelaire. Uh, 18, notice the dates, 1821 to 1867. So he dies just as uh, Yeats is two years old. Um, so, and he's considered in the French world, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to suggest here that the, the links between France and England in this regard are extremely significant and worth talking about. Um, and what, he's what he does here, we can take a look at it for a moment, is ça s'appelle les petits poèmes en prose. Little poems in prose. That's like saying, you know, little anarchists in Republicans, or little Dells in apples, or little apples in pears. Or it doesn't sound right. Comment est-ce que tu peux avoir des petits poèmes en prose? What, that, what does it mean to have a, a, a little... Well, I thought that, the, you know, the characteristic of poetry is that it's not prose. Well, he does away with that. So, what has he got? It's not given to everyone to be able to bathe in the multitude. Enjoyment of the crowd is an art. And he alone who makes, at the expense of the, humani the human race, a revelry of vitality, is he whom a fairy has inspired in his cradle with a taste for dressing and mask a hatred for domesticity, and a passion for travel. Multitude, solitude, two equal and interchangeable terms for the active and creative poet. He who does not know how to populate his solitude will not know how to be alone in the bustling crowd. The poet enjoys the incomparable privilege of being as he likes himself or others. Like errant souls searching for a body, he enters when he likes the personage of each, for him alone all is open, and if certain places appear to him closed, it is because in his eyes they are not worth the trouble of visiting. The solitary and thoughtful stroller derives a singular intoxication from this universal communion. He who easily weds the crown, the crowd knows the feverish ecstasies eternally deprived the selfish lock like a coffer and the lazy incarcerated like a mollusk. He adopts as his own, uh, own all-professions, all joys, and sorrows circumstances present to him. What men call love is very small, very restrained, and very weak compared to this ineffable orgy, to the sacred prostitution of the soul that gives itself entirely poetry and charity unexpectedly to the unknown passerby. It is good to teach sometimes the happy ones of the world, if only to humble them for a moment in their foolish pride, that there is greater happiness than theirs, vaster and more refined. Founders of colonies, ministers of people, missionaries of priests exiled to the ends of the earth, doubtless know something of these mysterious intoxications, and at the breast of the vast family that, is, that their genius has created, they must laugh sometimes at those who pity them uh, from their restless fortunes and chaste lives. So he's announcing a poetic that is at odds with virtually everything we know about poetry. poetry the poet, as you know, retires to a tower or sits atop a mountain or stares at a mountain and channels the great truth of the muse. The poet is a vessel through whom truth speaks. The poet is elevated, the poet is above the king, as you know, in the great chain of being from Lovejoy. Uh, there's God, and then there's the poet, and then there's the king, and then there's the nobility, and then there's the people who are described in realist novels. Uh, well, now the poet has come down from the mountain and is mixing in with the crowd. And there's another poem that he writes in the same collection in which he, the, the poet is wearing a crown that falls down into the mud, and he gets on his knees and he picks it up and he sticks it back on his head. Um, 
and the mud is composite of, of, of the experience of being the poet. This is a completely different type of a poet. And the conventions uh, are lost. In French or in English, all of the literary conventions that we had relied upon uh, have disappeared. He's an important example, and an important early example, uh, I think. The other, another example, which I'll just give you the name of, this is an unbelievable masterpiece um, uh, that, that I would suggest you take a look at, is Guillaume Apollinaire's poem called Zone. Um, and Zone is an interesting example because he uses uh, uh, juxtapositions of ideas that cannot possibly go together uh, in order to create meaning, um, something that we're going to see uh, a little bit later on. But if you wish to note the name and take a look at his work in translation, if you speak French, it's even better. Uh, he's another interesting example. And then perhaps the greatest example in any language in the Western world, which is Le Bateau Ivre d'Arthur Rimbaud. Um, and the dates, once again, are significant, 1854 to 1891. The date of this particular poem, the considered to be his masterpiece, um, is all the more significant. It's 1871. Arthur Rimbaud wrote for a few years and then stopped writing. You may have seen the film uh, about him and his relationship with Verlaine, uh, uh, Hollywood representation of this. Um, but he was a, the great, perhaps the greatest Parnassian poet of his generation. Uh, Verlaine was the greatest Parnassian poet of his generation, lived with his wife, uh, was a very uh, well, well established French poet. Um, and Rimbaud, he had uh, sent him a work. He was this young 15 year old kid from the countryside. Verlaine read it, couldn't believe it, thought it was an absolute revelation, um, invited him to Paris, and then landed up taking him as a lover. Uh, they had a, a tumultuous relationship that culminated with uh, uh, Verlaine shooting Rimbaud and then going to jail. Um, and then Rimbaud eventually, uh, with, very young, in his early 20s, stops writing forever and becomes a traitor. Uh, go, goes to Africa and others, other places and comes back and dies of some of the diseases that he contracted there. Um, this is a very interesting poem um, because it marks, uh, this is the end of the poem that I've put here, um, marks a, a, this kind of critical moment in French literature when um, the possibility of breaking tradition, but in still what is uh, quite a formal versification, um, breaks with the, the, the tradition of the language, juxtaposes words that never go together, um, and kind of celebrates drunkenness. Uh, he is an, the, the drunken law, and he's, he, is, he sees himself as a boat. So the poem, the, the Drunken Boat, describes, as it were, the poet who starts on a river and his rudder gets crushed. Uh, and so he's, the, the boat is now set adrift and then lands up in the sea of Marseille uh, and, and then just is taken by the waves and goes wherever the waves take it. And eventually you cannot distinguish the boat from the waves. So he's just entered into the, he's kind of, as it were, given up. Uh, trying to, to fight uh, the chaos of the world and, and instead uh, celebrates the chaos of the world. And it's a, it is a massively important poem um, because Rimbaud lands up becoming the kind of poster child for the modern world. And people right up to Jim Morrison, uh, Eddie Vedder, and, and sort of contemporary rock stars, um, but certainly all of the French and much of the English tradition look to Rimbaud for the inspiration of this idea of a complete immersion in the, in the modernist world. Uh, so it's, a, I, I think, a, a, a very important and, and interesting example. I'll give you the beginning. Uh, sorry, this is not the beginning. This is about three quarters of the way down. Now I, a boat lost in the foliage of caves, thrown by the storm into the birdless air, I, whose water-drunk carcass would not have been rescued by the monitors of the Hanseatic sailboats, Free, smoking, topped with violet fog, I who pierce the reddening sky like a wall, bearing delicious jam for good poets, lichens of sunlight and mucus of azure, who ran, now if you've ever heard Allen Ginsberg, listen to this, who ran spotted with small electric blooms, a wild plank escorted by black seahorses, when July's beat down with blows of cudgel as the ultramarine skies with burning uh, funnels, I, who trembled hearing at the 50 leagues off the moaning of the behemoth to heat in the thick maelstrom, eternal spinner of the blue immorbidity, I miss Europe with its ancient parapets. 
Sound familiar? <laughs> it's like, it's, it's uh, astonishing to read Howell and then read this. Uh, and he, no he notes that both his own uh, and this were, were inspirations for him. Because so much of what we associate with poetry goes here, even though we, we, we uh, keep some of the, the, the form. Um, another example of what's going on, right in the middle of Yeats's life, Hugo Ball, uh, he's worth mentioning at this particular time because it's the 100th anniversary of the founding of Dada at Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich. Here's, here's what happened to it. Joifanto bamla, ofali bamla, rossigim fa habla horem, higija gorem, higio bico vana solo huju, holaka hola, and so forth. And you can, act, there's actually a, a film, I'll show it to you next time, of him reciting this thing. So not only have you given up on poetic convention, you've actually given up on the meaning of words also. What the heck? Uh, you, you just, th this one, you've just, you've just thrown everything out. You, it, it's gone. Uh, there's, there's nothing left. Um, and these things, this, was a, this is transcribed correctly. This is the way it was reproduced. And he did it exactly like this. Not like he just randomly went up there and said, blah, 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 blah. No, this, was, this is a poem, very significant poem of the period. Um, and he works with another guy named Tristan Sarah, who, who does uh, sound poems. Uh, and sometimes they would work together. So the two of them are reciting incomprehensible poems at the same time. Uh, <laughs> And it's in here that you're finding some kind of truth. Well, this is not the truth that you were looking for in Milton. I'll tell you that right now. Um, it, it's something else. It's, a, it's some effort to maybe tap into our completely un, uh, incomprehensible subconscious. Um, if it is the case that at our very, at the, the base of ourselves, is not a, a, a comprehensible soul connected or tethered to God, but rather a chaotic id. Uh, with all of its pulsations and so forth that are demonstrated in dreams, then we need to do things like start writing down our dreams uh, to find out what's actually going on in the world and not deferring to the so-called realist world. And you'd be crazy. There's no truth there, obviously. It's just uh, uh, Plato's cave. Um, another example from uh, uh, Ezra Pound, who was inspired, by, as you know, by just about every language in the world. Oh, my songs, why do you look so eagerly and so curiously into people's faces? Will you find your lost dead among them? That's it. So now you're kind of left on the cliff, and you're like, what is this? What, how do I read this? What do I do with this? So these are some of the examples um, of what's going on in the world, uh, most of them during Yeats's lifetime, some of them preceding Yeats. And you say, all right, well, now we're going to study Yeats. For those of you who have read him, you know that it's the very opposite of experimentation. Uh, and my argument's going to be throughout this course that Yeats believes that the world, falling apart as it is, requires us to go back to the symbols and the traditions that mean something in order to resuscitate truth and meaning in a chaotic uh, world. So I'm going to read to you the way he would read uh, one of his poems. And I should tell you that I've engaged in the bizarre exercise with Marcia that I absolutely adored. We flew to Ireland and I brought my, uh, my video camera and she filmed me reading all of the poems that Yeats wrote in the places where he wrote them. And I strongly advocate, I mean, uh, if, you're in tr if you want to travel in a really interesting way, this is an amazing way to travel. You go, uh, I, I do this with students every year, we go to Mont Blanc and we read Shelley's uh, Mont Blanc at the base of Mont Blanc, it is mind-boggling to do this. It is another level of understanding that, that happens when you do this. Um, uh, Mont Blanc, as far as I can tell, and I'll bet you I'm right, uh, was composed on a bridge uh, right above the Riviere Arbe. And when you stand on that bridge and you read the poem, the things that he describes you can see, so you know you're roughly in the right place. Well, I did the same thing with all of Yeats. Because Yeats is so place-oriented that Yeats is going to tell you about the places where he lived and the things that he did. And I was given this um, book from the, is it from the library or is this? Uh, My son picked it up on the street. Oh, I love that. Okay. Well, it couldn't be better. Um, it's the perfect choice. Um, in one of th there are many tragedies, as you know, in literary history. One of the tragedies is that Lord Byron's um, autobiography was burned um, by his uh, publisher. Uh, we can all mourn that uh, passage. Uh, 
there was so much sex and fun in that book that we would have had enough to keep us going for a long time, um, which is unfortunately why he burned it. Um, there are heroic stories. For example, all of Kafka was supposed to be burned um, uh, and uh, instead uh, was saved. Uh, Marquis de Sade's work should never have survived, but a jail uh, guard uh, helped him carry it out when uh, the bestie was on fire. Um, so we have all of these, these different stories. Well, the, one that, the story that relates to Yeats is that a BBC decided to have him read m his most significant poems on the radio um, in the 1930s, and he did, and they were recorded, and a few years later, some young kid, on an in, probably on an internship, what we call today an internship, I don't know what they're called back then, uh, you know, um, labor, <laughs> um, recorded on top of them, and we lost them forever. So. It's the only recordings of Yeats that have ever been made uh, were lost forever. There's one left, um, and it includes this poem, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to give you this uh, next time. Uh, today I'll do it for you. Um, so you can actually hear him read, Yeats. We're going to be able to hear Yeats read in this class, mind-boggling. Um, and the poem that survived, there are three of them, two, two shorter ones, and then a little bit of conversation, and then this poem, is The Lake I Live In Is Free. And I'll tell you, it's, an, it's a particularly interesting uh, work, and I'm glad it was in this collection found by, in New York. Um, because when Marsh and I went there, it's, it's a poem that he wrote relatively early on. He was planning on going and spending the night on a lake isle, an island in the middle of a lake. And you, we went to the shore where he stood and deliberated, because his uncle didn't want him to go, uh, deliberated as, as to whether or not he should go. So, you, you walk down and you can see where the boat was to be launched from. It's still there, uh, the, the, the little dock there. And he stood there and he thought about it and then he decided not to go, as it turns out. And instead he wrote this poem called The Lake Isle of Innes Free. And I read it exactly from the spot where he wrote it, whether he wrote all of it there or not. He certainly composed the idea there. And as I was reading it, things that happened in the poem happened to me when Marsha, we actually have this on film. I'll, let's see if I can dig it up for you. It's, it's amazing. The way he reads it will already be the kind of opposite of what we just saw in Hugo Ball uh, or Charles Baudelaire. The way that he reads it is to emphasize every possible poetic tradition that you can possibly find. A lot of poets w might do something like this in their early years and then abandon it later on, the way Picasso abandons realist painting, right? He doesn't. In fact, he goes the opposite direction, and his work becomes increasingly formalistic, as you'll see. But he reads it something, he, he, on the radio, he reads it something like this. I will arise and go now, and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin built there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the vales of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet swings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway or on the pavements grey, I hear it in the deep hot core. It's a little bit staticky when you'll hear it on the BBC, but it's more or less like that. And as I was reading this, the, the, literally the, la the, the waves began to lap at my feet, uh, and there, was, uh, there were birds that flew over. It was an astonishing moment, but there's uh, really something to be said for the relationship between um, place and verse in this case. So what he's, here he is ruminating on this idea of, of, of a departure. What he eventually does, uh, and this book ha happens to have it, so we may as well take a quick look at it, he decides that the modern world, it can be rescued by the rehabilitation of symbols and so forth. But it's not enough to invoke these symbols. It's not enough to just use them. You actually have to buy them. 
So for those of you who have, has anybody been to the tour of Al-Ali? Again, if you're gonna go travel, you may as well go to travel and follow literary people around. He bought a damn tower. Because it's not enough to just invoke towers. And then he would call upon the bees, a poem that we'll look at, to, to build, to, to, the honeybees, to build a nest in his stair. Why? Because the honeybee is the absolute image of the poet. Right? He goes around gathering images and he comes back and he makes honey. And it's a perfect image of the poet. And he sits up in his tower, and we're going to look at poems, poems about this that are going to make you cry with happiness, and, 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 and they're so amazing. He's going to sit and he's going to write poetry in his tower. Uh, and he's going to talk about Cato's sword, which he owns. He's going to talk about roses, which he plants, and bees that are in front of him. Um, and he believes that the rebuilding of this tower, because he also engages in its, in its uh, renovation, is an act that will protect him against the howling winds from the Irish Sea. That is to say, the, the, the nameless, chaotic forces that are destroying civilization. So at the end of this little book, he says, I love this, and it's there, it, it is there. It's, it's called, To Be Carved on a Stone on Tour Balali. It is carved on a stone on Tour Balali, if you go there. He says, I, the poet, William Yeats, with old mill boards and sea green slates and smithy work from the Gort Forge restored this tower for my wife, George. And may these characters remain when all is ruined once again. And then he in has that inscribed in stone. Absolutely amazing. Does this end at 11 or 10.45 or now? Uh, oh, thank goodness. Okay, phew. All right, the anxiety of the passage of time. <laughs> so there's almost everything about this example that's significant because he, he restores this place so that he can then go inside of it and work. And he does the work of, of the poet, which is that he builds lines that are as memorable and beautiful as the lines that I've been reading out with you, and we're gonna look at some mind-bogglingly beautiful lines in this class. So he sees himself as, a, in, in a sense, a laborer similar to the bee, who has the huge task of going to all of the flowers of the world and figuring out their meaning, and then coming back and creating honey. But as he's doing it, he has friends. For example, Ezra Pound, who would have been a secretary of his, uh, uh, James Joyce, who, whose work he defended in Irish Parliament um, against uh, the charges of obscenity when he became a senator. So he's very much aware of the literary currents of the period, but is going exactly against them, exactly against uh, the grain of all of them. So uh, in, in, this, in this modern world, um, this is the type of uh, thing that he's doing. And when uh, he also does ver quite strange uh, experiments himself in which he has different characters talking to each other um, about immortality. We happen to have another one here that I'll give, uh, mention. Uh, it's called The Saint and the Hunchback. Hunchback. Stand up and lift your hand and bless a man that finds great bitterness in thinking of his lost renown a Roman Caesar is held down under this hump. Saint. God tries each man according to a different plan. I shall not cease to bless because I lay about me with taws. That night and morning I may thrash Greek Alexander from my flesh, Augustus Caesar, and after these that great rogue Alibides. Hunchback. To all that in your flesh have stood and blessed, I give my gratitude, honored by all in their degrees, but most to Alcibiades. So, here, as you'll see in many of his works, as you begin to read through them, there's a conversation, uh, often a conversation between two diametrically opposed uh, characters. So not surprising, if you have not looked at uh, his work, is that he was also a great playwright. Uh, and a lot of his plays um, have been reproduced, particularly uh, because he was part of the kind of Irish revival. The, uh, 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 his politics, as you know, were the politics of, of uh, an independent um, uh, Ireland, and that meant a recovery of 
those elements from the past that allow you to, to constitute a nation. So I want to briefly talk with you about that for a second because it's, it's part of this. So what you're hearing is profound sense of conservatism uh, in his work. And as you'll, you'll notice this, a kind of literary conservatism. Um, by conservatism, I don't mean what is now being bandered about uh, and destroyed and trampled on. Uh, it, what I mean is conserving uh, traditions and ideas from the past that uh, deserve our protection uh, and, and deserve to be named as such. So he's, as a poet, um, he's very conservative. But he has another side to him, which is quite modern, which is that he, would, he, he was, as it were, shopping around for images. So in his life, he's also trying to do things that are quite modern, which is he's, he's becomes part of the, he becomes interested in Rosicrucian, uh, Rosicrucian work, he becomes interested in black magic, he becomes interested in white magic, uh, he joins Sin Fine. One of the, the only characteristic we can say about the different organizations that he becomes affiliated to is that he got kicked out of all of them. <laughs> like W.C. Fields. Uh, so he has this really, really wacky side to him. Um, and what he was doing, I think, in each of the, uh, and he, you know, he admired to no end uh, Madame Blavatsky in Theosophy. Uh, this attempt to tap into some truth in the universe uh, that's out there. So he's running against the modernist current in the sense that he's not looking inside of his own psyche for truth, but he's consistent with the modernist uh, poet in the sense that he is trying to find eternal truth in a kind of crevice in the universe. Like there's some, he's peering into these weird spaces, magical spaces, and looking for truth. Um, the, the other point to note as you begin to read him is uh, he had the unfortunate um, experience of falling madly in love with a woman. Uh, her name is Maud Gone. Again, you, you, you earn your name. <laughs> you know? He tried to marry her and she was constantly gone. Um, um, Maud Gone, and she was this. Uh, I think he, I, I, I always forget, I don't know if you remember from reading the biography, I, I think he asked her to marry him 18 times or something, something along that. It was a double digit number, I remember, maybe triple, I don't know, I think it was 18 times. And she turned him down every time. Um, so he has this uh, very frustrated uh, relationship to love, and that will dominate uh, his writings because she becomes a kind of Helen of Troy for him, and she, he makes the comparison. So in his personal life, He's frustrated by his inability to be with the one woman who he truly loves. Um, and, and you're going to see the effects of that all the way through his poetry. The other uh, uh, significant uh, point as, you'll begin, as you begin to read is that relatively early on he becomes obsessed with being old. Um, and I, I used to come back from school in Boston. I lived in Montreal. I used to go back home. And, you know, it was kind of complicated because I'd bicycle home, you know, young and mm, crazy and whatever, bicycle back from Boston to Montreal, and then I'd talk to my mother about poetry. <laughs> and I started smoking a pipe, which I still do. Um, and, and it, it, you know, it, it, for, him, for me, he, he was channeling something that, that seemed eternal. And I became obsessed with, with, with the idea of, of aging and... and erecting monuments that make sense for the future. And I began to write poetry, which I still do. So you, you'll find him, I think, inspiring because he's somebody who tries to erect edifices that make sense for eternity. None of this stuff is supposed to be there for a little while. It is literally being um, etched in stone. Um, so uh, yeah. the other side of him um, is the political. And the political I won't get into very much because it, 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 it's it's contradictory in the way that he's contradictory, but, but I think it's worth knowing something about it. Um, he supports, as I said, he's, uh, he himself is Protestant, but he supports an independent uh, Irish nation, and he is named to the Senate when the independent na uh, Irish nation is founded. So he also has what was, as it were, a kind of radical side, uh, this, this sense of that England um, had done great uh, disservice and, and uh, oppression in Ireland and that they deserved a state. 
Well, as you know from, for example, the breakup of the Balkans, from the fall of Yugoslavia, one of the first things that happens when people begin to ally themselves to the idea of a state, I'm from Quebec, I'm very familiar with this, the first thing you do is you change all the names. Right? Uh, so street names, Dorchester Street becomes La Rue René Levesque, for example. Um, you change all the names. And then you, in, then you have another history. Right? Because there's one history that you don't like, which is history that, you, that when you lost the war uh, uh, in Quebec uh, and the English dominated. Uh, so now you want to have a different memory. So I don't know if you've been to Quebec, but the license plate uh, on them says, Je me souviens. I remember. What you remember is not what the English remember, it's what the French want you to remember, which is that 1608 they won <laughs> in the Wolf Montcalm War. Um, similar things are going on with Yeats, which is that he, he, part of his goal is to resuscitate a past that legitimizes the greatness of Ireland. This is one of the great horrors of nationalism. One of the great dangers of nationalism is it can become exclusionary because it recovers a history that may not be compatible with the history of some people who were there. or are hearing this type of thing in the election. You know, who's a true American? It's a big, big conversation. And you know, to erect the walls is to erect the walls against so-called true Americans. Right? But you get this everywhere. This is, you get this in Israel, you get this in Quebec, you get it in Catalonia. Places in particular where there's some strained relationship to the other, you get this. You get this very present uh, in Yates. So he looks for the, the great past of Ireland. And he does so by looking at images from the past. He gets involved with the idea of Gaelic revival, of the revival of Gaelic language, which goes on today. So he tries to bolster up the legitimacy of the Irish state at the same time, which links him in uh, an unfortunate way to, uh, to uh, elements of fascism. Uh, so you can, you can see Yeats uh, in ways that are not dissimilar from Spain uh, in the latter part of his, his life, in which the, the, what we saw in Nazi Germany, looking for the great moments and then glorifying them against the hideous uh, either Jewish art or degenerate art or whatever else there is. So there are parallels here as well, and the, 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 the era is somewhat similar, that you've got you know, the degenerate art, as you know. I mean, Hitler did everybody a, a lot of horrors, but the one thing that he did do is he saved a lot of great art from destruction by making the Museum of Degenerate Art and, as opposed to burning it. And the reason why he did it was to tell us how horrible it was and stupid <laughs> and pathetic and Jewish it was. So in so doing, he saved it from destruction, right? So, but he does it in order to glorify. We saw this also in the Zola course. Um, uh, the Universal Exhibitions do the same thing. You try to glorify one part of history. And Yeats does this by looking to a past, a glorious past, Protestant past in particular, and glorifying uh, elements of that past. So in resuscitating the poetic symbols, he's also trying to resuscitate ideas and particular currents of history from a particular time. So this, you will, you'll, you'll sense this as you read this. I think that he does almost everything in, a, in, a, in the service of art. This is why I... You know, I, I don't feel the, about him the way I feel, one might feel about Ezra Pound, uh, who, you know, who became uh, not just proto-fascist, but pro-fascist. Yeats wasn't pro-fascist. Yeats had characteristics of a fascist uh, that include things like nostalgia and love of the state and so forth, things that some of us might even have ourselves. Um, it, it kind of depends on what else you've got, how much you hate the other, right, as to whether it's fascistic or or multicultural, or whatever you'd want to call it. So as you're reading it, you'll... So where, where I want to conclude then is to say, you've got the poetic tradition, a heavy, powerful, uh, historical, weighty tradition that he's building back. And then you've got a historical, political, historical tradition in the context. And he, in a sense, brings the two together and actually buys a place from which uh, he can then build an art and, in so doing, participate in the building of a modern Ireland. Now I'm really glad I signed up to do this course. <laughs>
<laughs> I, I've, I've been wanting to do this for years. I just, uh...